This is the Toronto Eaton Centre. By some measures, it is the busiest shopping mall in North America, with over 230 stores and restaurants, ranging from Colonel's Popcorn to Colonel's Popcorn Level 1 North. This is the Sydney Desalination Plant. It's a critical piece of water infrastructure for Australia's most populous city, with the capacity to service 1.5 million residents' water needs. This is the Brussels Airport. You might recognize it from Season 3 of Jetlag the Game. It's where Ben what do all three of these things have in common? First, if you try to eat them, you would die. Second, they're all owned, either completely or primarily, by the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. The Ontario Teachers Pension Plan is exactly what it sounds like, a pension plan for teachers in the Canadian province of Ontario. It's also nothing like what it sounds like in that it sounds like a retirement plan for teachers and not an organization that is the former owner of the Toronto Raptors and the current owner of multiple Indian toll roads. Yet somehow, it's both. All of which raises the question, wait, what? Let's start with the basics. A pension, if you don't know, is a fund that's used to provide people money once they retire, typically on a monthly basis. Pensions are usually funded through a combination of employee and employer contributions. Although, and don't tell anyone this, employer contributions are actually just employee contributions because if the employer didn't pay that money for the pension, they would just give it to the employee, so whenever you hear people say employer contribution, that's BS and you should call it out. But anyways, the point is, when employers and employees contribute to pensions, most of a pension's money comes, at least hopefully, from investments. All the contributed money is pooled and invested, and at least theoretically, the profits from those investments are able to provide beneficiaries of the pension, in this case, teachers in Ontario, with more money than was contributed in the first place. In simpler terms, teachers plus stonks equals profit. But none of that answers the fundamental question. Why is the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan so massive? And also, why does it own five airports? Well, let me take you back to a magical time called the 1980s. The Cold War was ending, the Hot Pocket was beginning, and the pensions for Ontario teachers were run exclusively by the Ontario government, who only invested in government bonds. Bonds are a really safe investment because you only lose your money if your government pretty much collapses, and that would never happen, especially not in the next few years. But because of that safety, governments only need to offer bonds with quite low returns. In the long run, Canadian bonds have about a 1% net return. But one day, the Ontario government and Ontario teachers decided that instead of having less money, they'd prefer to have more money, and so they established a new pension for its teachers that would be run independently and could invest in whatever it wanted. And what it wanted was to establish a whole new model of pension investing, which is is now called the Canadian model. See, typically, pension plans would entrust their money to various managers, private investors whose job it is to take money from pensions, endowments, and various rich people, and then invest it in exchange for often pricey fees. The only real job of a pension is often choosing which managers to give their money to. The Ontario Teachers Pension, though, decided to do not that, instead mostly building out its own investing team, thus avoiding those fees. Basically, instead of investing their money in a bunch of hedge funds and private equity groups and whatever, like many pensions, Ontario Teachers Pension essentially became its own hedge fund slash private equity group slash whatever. That, by the way, is the answer to the question in the title that I so cleverly entice you into watching this video with. Ontario Teachers has an office in Singapore because instead of hiring some Singaporean manager to invest their money in Southeast Asia and Oceania, they'd much rather have their own office there and invest it themselves. Plus, they can go bungee jumping whenever they want. That's the first key part of the Canadian model, direct investing. The second part is what they invest in. While most pensions are typically invested in mostly stocks and bonds, Ontario Teachers is much more interested in completely buying out companies or just buying actual physical stuff, particularly infrastructure, in part because the long-term returns needed for a pension fit well with the long-term nature of infrastructure. That's why if you take a flight in Europe or drink water in Sydney or drive in Kanartaka, there's a good chance you're helping a former kindergarten teacher remodel her kitchen. The third part of the Canadian model is who and how they hire. Turns out, if you want to act like a hedge fund or private equity group, you have to pay like one. That's why Ontario Teachers spends way more than most pensions on talent. In 2018, the head of Ontario Teachers, Ron Mock, made $5.6 million. For comparison, in 2019, the head of the US's largest teacher pension, the California State Teachers Retirement System, made $282,000. I'm certainly not here to argue that it's good to pay guys with names like Ron Muck the cost of 3.7 moonlights, but on the other hand, California's plan is only hitting 66% of its funding obligations, while Ontario Teachers is fully funded and also owns North America's leading muscle producer, which is sick. And ultimately, those muscle farms, toll roads, and Krish Boshes have added up. Ontario Teachers has not only turned itself into one of the largest institutional investors in the world, so big that it's a partner organization of the World Economic Forum, it's also set a model for the rest of Canada, whose public pensions have consistently outperformed peers for the last two decades by following this Canadian model. 
I should say here at the end that normally I would feel kind of bad that I spent this whole video basically shilling for a giant financial institution, but hey. Ultimately, that institution's whole thing is to give teachers more money, which I think is great, especially because maybe if they have more money, they won't keep making me do their job for them. As is often the case, I'm outside of the US as I write and record this ad read. I travel quite a lot, and that means I work while traveling quite a lot. What I've learned through that is that it really is valuable to make your internet work the way it does at home. Increasingly, sites are customized to where you physically are, blocked off, restricted, or changed. That means that, for example, being able to go on American websites that have blocked off European users because of their GDPR data security requirements really can matter when you rely on those websites, as I do for video research. It's also just nice to be able to spend a quiet evening while traveling watching the same shows you would at home on streaming sites without having to worry about geoblocking by using a VPN set to your home country. And vice versa, if you find a show on Netflix while abroad that isn't on your home version, you can use a VPN to set your location back abroad to continue watching. All in all, VPNs are a critical tool for internet users, and there certainly are plenty of them, but in my experience, our sponsor NordVPN has done the best job at getting both the big and especially the small stuff right. It's easy to use, has over 5,400 servers in 60 countries, has amazing speed, and works across pretty much any device or operating system. So if you don't have a VPN yet or want a better one, I'd recommend trying out NordVPN, especially since if you click the button on screen or head to the link in the description, you'll get our exclusive deal, plus it's risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee and will help support the channel.